Hello class. Here we are in week 15. We've got two more uh, studies in 1 Corinthians. So we've got this week, week 15, and then next week, week 16, and we will be through the book of 1 Corinthians. A uh, quick look back, as we know, Paul is uh, uh, speaking, writing letters to this church at Corinth. Uh, they had some problems. He was uh, complimenting on what they did uh, well, and he was kind of shaping up what they had gone off the deep end on. And here in uh, chapter 15, uh, there is a discussion. Some of the uh, uh, people at Corinth in this church were questioning resurrected bodies. I mean, we know that our body is not going to stay in the grave. Our bodies are going to be resurrected uh, and taken up. And so how is that going to work? Don't know. Uh, I kind of hope, you know, that I have a little say-so in that. I'd like to be a little taller. I'd like to have black, dark, curly hair when he resurrects me. Uh, so I don't know how that's going to work. But uh, it is in your scriptures that our bodies are going to be resurrected. So these people at the Church of Corinth were questioning that. They were saying, how's that going to be? And this is uh, Paul's answer to them in chapter 15. So let's read chapter 15, uh, 1 through 11. Our lesson is titled, Death, Where Is Your Sting? You see, Paul is going to show them why the resurrection is going to happen in their bodies. Their bodies are not going to stay in the grave. Uh, forever, and he goes to Christ's resurrection in chapter 15. So let's read those verses. It says, Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. You know, a lot of people will say that that verse is saying that we can lose our faith, we can lose our salvation. That's not what that says. Paul is saying, uh, it, is, it is the good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. In other words, you never really believed and accepted Jesus Christ in the first place. If we believe and accept Jesus Christ, then he comes into us and we are uh, uh, sealed, we are saved. And so it goes on in verse 3, I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James, and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. For I am the least of all the apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. But whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out his special favor on me, and not without results, for I have worked harder than any of the other apostles, yet it was not I, but God who was working through me by his grace. So it makes no difference whether I preach or they preach, for we all preach the same message you have already believed. Paul is taking them back, and he is saying not only did Jesus Christ come as a man, born as man, and then was crucified, put in the tomb, but he was resurrected. He defeated death. And that's what we'll read at the end of this chapter. You know, death, where's your victory? Death, where's your sting? He's reminding them that death is not the final uh, uh, step. Uh, there is more. There is life after death and that their bodies will be resurrected and taken up. It says in your study guide that the chief purpose of 1 Corinthians was to answer questions and challenges from the Corinth church None were more pivotal than questions about resurrection. It says the word gospel means good news. The good news extends to every area of believers' lives and into eternity. The essence of the gospel is that Jesus became man, died for our sins, and was raised according to the promises of Scripture. Christ's death is part of the gospel because it is the good news that he took on our sins, our death on the cross. The resurrection is part of the gospel because it shows that Christ is God, meaning he can cover all our sins. The scriptures pointed to Christ coming and dying 
as a substitutionary uh, death. It says, if Jesus had stayed in the tomb, then he was just a man. Any man can die, in fact all do. Only the God-man, Jesus Christ, could have died the death that took on the sins of man and dealt with him eternally. The resurrection is the power of salvation. The cross is the place of salvation. So it says that, that Jesus came as God-man, was walked on the earth, was tempted by all of the things that were tempted and yet never sinned, was perfect. He was crucified on the cross. His shed blood covered our sins. He was buried after he gave up his life. The Romans and the uh, Jews did not kill him. He gave up his life. And then he was resurrected. It says the same Holy Spirit that resurrected Jesus Christ lives in us. Now that's power, brothers and sisters. And he was resurrected from death. He conquered death. Where the devil thought he had won, it was a surprise. Christ rose from the dead. He came back. He walked on this earth for a certain amount of time. People saw him, knew he had been resurrected. And that's the reason that the uh, disciples refused, refused to say that it was a, a fake uh, deal, that it was all just made up. You might lie uh, uh, for something, but you will not die for a lie. And those disciples were all martyred and, and died horrible deaths and refused to say that uh, this Jesus Christ did not come back from the dead. They knew. They knew it was real. And so we believe the witnesses now. We've not seen Jesus Christ, but we believe the witnesses. We believe the writings of Peter and, and Paul and, and what they saw. We, we believe that. We believe by faith, and that's what makes us uh, Christians in, in the church. That's what we uh, work on. And then it says in Luke 24, 44 through 49, let's go to Luke 24. So we go to Luke 24, 44 through 49. It said, then he said, this is Jesus, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and raise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations. Beginning in Jerusalem, there is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things, and now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. You know, you've been in our uh, class long enough to know if we say who's the church, uh, we're the church. And if we ask where the Holy Spirit's at, the Holy Spirit is in us with power. And Jesus Christ left this earth and sent the Holy Spirit down to be with us forever and ever. Amen. And so Paul is saying, to the church at Corinth. Don't forget. Don't forget this gospel that you need to be preaching. Don't forget this Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. And this resurrection is going to take place the same as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. We will be raised from the dead and we will be with the Father in heaven forever. It says, what, did the, uh, what does Jesus promise in verse 49, and how does that affect the church's ability to fulfill its mission? Verse 49 in Luke, uh, it says, let's go back there for just a second and touch on that. And it says, Now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with the power of heaven. In other words, we would not be able to carry that out without the power of the Holy Spirit. In our own human nature, it would be impossible. But in the power of the Spirit that lives in us, it propels us and the Spirit speaks for us whenever we're out telling people the gospel, the good news. It says, what has changed about the church's mission since Jesus' original charge to the disciples? Nothing. Nothing has changed on that original mission. 
we have the Holy Spirit. Our mission is clear. Our mission is still the same. We are to be telling people the good news. We are to be telling people about Christ coming, about Christ's death on the cross, and about Christ raising from the dead, especially during this time of the year. Thanksgiving is going to be this next week, and then Christmas. It is a great time to be sharing the gospel. And what even a better time, since we're under all this coronavirus, and people are getting sick, and some people are passing away, and some people are afraid. It's a, a great time to uh, love on people, to share with people about what Christ has done for you, and to walk without fear. And some of you are saying, well, Ron, how do I walk without fear? The last thing I'll leave you with today is, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 54 through 58. Chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. If I can get this one page to turn here. It says, Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Why do we fear? Why do we worry about dying when we know we're going to die one of these days? We've never been promised tomorrow. We only have today. Why is the church so fearful about what politics holds for us in the future? who our president is, what the Congress and Senate's going to do. Why are we so fearful as the church? Well, the devil tries to make us fearful, and he can for a little bit. But when we go to the Word, when we let the Holy Spirit come alive in us, fear goes away. Fear goes away of this coronavirus. Fear goes away of what a government is going to be able to do because we are not of this earth. We are are ambassadors from a different country. We belong to the Lord. And so, uh, this Thanksgiving, uh, you know, our little Thanksgiving jar that we have in the class because of the coronavirus and not being able to meet, it's a little bare. But you know what? We can give thanks uh, this, this Thanksgiving for what we have, and we can give thanks that death has no power over us whatsoever as a Christian. When we die, we will be beamed up to, to heaven. Our body will be raised later, and we will be with God our Father in heaven forever and ever. And that's a good thing. Fear should be cast away. Our anxiety should be put down, because once we realize that, church, nothing, nothing can stand between us and a peaceful, joyful life, and we should be spreading that to everybody we come in contact with. So this Thanksgiving, I want you to forget about the coronavirus. It's uh, out there. It's going to be out there until we get a vaccine or until the Lord takes it away from us. But don't be fearful of it. Uh, we know there'll be other viruses come, and we're not going to be fearful and anxious about that. We know that uh, governments are going to change, and we're going to have different laws. We're going to have different things that are going to happen, and that will uh, shouldn't be anxious for us. And we become what Jesus Christ asked us to be. So uh, this Thanksgiving, I hope you and your family have a good uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, we will be in Sunday school tomorrow. We're taping this on Saturday. Tomorrow we will be in Sunday school, so I hope to see you there at 8 o'clock. And let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this lesson, Father God. Father God, uh, death has no power over us as a Christian, Father God. When we die, we know where we're headed. And Father God, what a wonderful place you've prepared for us, and we look forward to that. But until that day, Father God, help us to be down here, Father God, spre uh, spreading the good news, Father God, that anyone, everyone can have that uh, salvation experience, Father God. Have that security in their lives, Father God, that they don't have to worry anymore. All of their sins be washed away, Father God, that they be right in the palm of your hand, Father God. Nothing can snatch them out of there, Father God, as your scriptures say. 
And Father, we thank you so much uh, this Thanksgiving Day that we give thanks to you, Father God, for what you've done. Father God, for all the good things that you've given us and all the good things that you're about to do for us in the future. Lord God, we uh, thank you for these scriptures. We thank you for your word that encourages us. We thank you so much for the Holy Spirit that resides in us with power. And Father God, we give this day and all the days over to you, Father God, and your will be done. Lord God, we thank you for what you do, and we thank you for what you are about to do. In Jesus Christ's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Until I see you later on down the road, you stay safe and healthy.